just as we've done each time, um, but it's really important to get this in your mind. Actually, when I pastored, I never started exegeting the book till I'd read it 20 times, just over and over and over again, because you have to know what you're talking about before you, you start talking about it. So let's read it. Revelation chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show to his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of the thing, all the things which he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and them that keep the things that are written therein. The time is at hand. You watch me. I'm counting off the threes here. Each time I come to one of these, you'll see it. And, and you should get to where that second nature for you to look at that and say, well, there's three of something. Um, so the Bible says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. There's the three again, the three from the Trinity, um, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten from the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and had made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion both now and forevermore. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Every eye will see him and they which pierced him and all the kingdoms of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is which was, which is to come, the Almighty. And now here's where we pick up today. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of our Lord Jesus Christ, there are three of them there, and, um, was in the isle called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the, big, uh, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. There's seven. Sevens are important too. And I turned to see the voice which spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. I told you seven is important. And in the midst of seven gold, uh, the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, um, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were as white as snow, um, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame as of a flame of fire, and he and his feet like unto fine brass, as they were as if they were burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword, and his countenance was like uh, was the, as the sun that sh uh, shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am him that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of death, of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which thou shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And God will add his blessing to this, the reading of his word. This morning we're going to start in the, um, uh, we're now leaving the introductory portion of the passage and we're going to be confronted with a supernatural vision of Jesus. We're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory in all of his splendor. And so what we're going to be looking at is a descriptive revelation of Christ 
in this vision. We're, he's going to tell us something about himself by what we see. Um, and I want you to notice here all the way that the Bible says like or as. This is figurative language. This doesn't mean that Christ literally has a, a sword coming out of his mouth. Um, it doesn't mean that his feet are actually the color of bronze. It means it is as bronze or it's like the word of God or the, the sword coming out of his mouth. So what he's signaling to us is these things stand for things. And were they real? Absolutely. There was a reality about this, but there were symbolic meanings with it. And so we're going to be looking at that. But before we do that, I want to look at the recipients of the vision because he takes a great deal of time um, the verses uh, 9 through 11 that we just read in your hearing to tell about himself and about the people to whom he is writing. And so, and by the way, that is uh, a, a uh, picture taken from the grotto of St. John. Um, that is where uh, traditionally St. John could sit and look and on a clear day you can look across the Mediterranean Sea and see the... Um, uh, I guess it's the Aegean Sea there, you can look across and see Ephesus from um, uh, now. We're not right now in that picture. I think it's too cloudy for that. But nonetheless, on a really clear day, you could actually see the city of Ephesus. And John is there. So John is writing. And I want to look at what John has to say. So let's begin by looking at, um, first of all, let's look at his partnership the faithful elder, his partnership. And I want you to notice some interesting things that are said here about John. First of all, let's begin with the simple familiarity in this book. Now, there are some people that insist on um, making sure that everybody knows what their title is. Um, you know, I am Dr. So-and-so, or I am... Uh, professor so-and-so or whatever like that. And, and the people who generally spend a lot of times worried about titles are basically people who are stuck on self. Now, if there is any man who could have been stuck on a title, it would have been John. After all, he was the last of the apostles. All the rest of them are dead. And so basically at this point, if you really wanted to know somebody who knew Jesus, you had to go to John because he was one of the few that was still around that knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And he could have thumped his chest and he could have talked about how I was the disciple that Jesus was closest to. And on that night where he was betrayed, I leaned back against his breast and, and he told me secrets that he wouldn't tell anybody else. I was close to Christ. Um, you see these people all the time, especially in the Pentecostal movement, that they talk about, um, you know, so-and-so had a vision of Jesus. And boy, that's really important. And the emphasis is on the person who had the vision of Jesus. Well, that's not the truth with John. John is not concerned about John. He doesn't say, I am the Apostle John. He doesn't say, I am the Bishop John. He doesn't say, I am the head of the church right now, John. No, he just calls it, I'm just John. I, John. Just John. Simple John. I love that, don't you? Um, people who are, are down to earth, very familiar. And, and that's the way it was John. And you know, that's the way Paul was. Um, Paul could have, boy, he could have pulled out their credentials, couldn't he? Um, but, but Paul would say, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Um, he, I'm just a servant. That's all I am. So first of all, we see the simple familiarity. Secondly, you see the same father. Because the Bible says, who also am your brother. Now look here. Family doesn't always get along, do they? If you had a brother or a sister, I bet you all fought like cats and dogs. That's the way it is. When, when you're in a family, um, she looked at me, she, she walked in my room, um, he didn't do his job, mom, she's doing this to me, 
you know, boy, I tell you what, inside the family it's petty squabble and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? You get outside the family and somebody starts picking on a little sister, those sleeves go down, the, those fists come up. Why? Because I'm going to protect my little sister. Um, she's fan I can abuse her, but you can't, right? That's the idea. Well, John is saying we're in the same family here. Isn't that wonderful to know that we have the same father? John may have been gone now for uh, nearly 2,000 years, but we still have the same father. And the same God that loved John is the same God that loves you and me. Amen. Yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus Christ is the same. And so, my friend, let me say this to you today. He's saying to these people, I understand what you're going through. We have the same father. We're in the same family. We belong to the family of God. Look, there's only one way to be a part of God's family. I know that there are no unsaved people in the class today, but I'll just say it because I, I want to say it very clearly, and we ought to say it every time we meet. There's only one way to be saved, and that is to come to a realization that you're not saved and that you need a Savior, and that you need somebody to come into your heart and life and save you. You're wrongly related with God, and you need to be right with God. I, I asked the kids the other day, I said, do you know what righteousness is? I don't know. It's one of those big words and everything like that. I said, when you're at your house, and you've done something wrong, and mama looks at you and she knows you've done something wrong. Is everything right between you and your mom? Oh, no. Uh-uh. And they started talking. Oh, boy. I could sell blackmail tapes. And uh, one little girl told her about her daddy uh, cheating on a math test um, when he was a little boy. He was trying to make a point with her teacher that, you know, you got to be honest all the time and everything. But the only thing she came away with, my dad was a cheat when he went to school. Uh, so they tell all kinds of things. But, but here's the thing. You have to realize you're a sinner. And when there is something wrong between you and your parent, then that thing has to be made right. Now, you're still a part of the family, right? But you have to make it right. Well, now... We're not a part of God's family when we're born into this world. We're part of Adam's family. And there is a, a problem between us. And the only way that things can be right between God and, and me is that somebody has to fulfill the right things that God says need to be done. And I have to turn from my wickedness and turn to him. And so what I do when I come to Christ as my personal Savior is... Um, I recognize that Christ has fulfilled the righteousness of God and that if I come and put my case in his hands, that now God accepts me on the basis of Jesus Christ. We talked, I taught them the doctrine of imputation. Can you believe that? Those kids understand imputation at this time, putting something into somebody else's account giving to somebody else that which they do not deserve. And that was true of Christ. He got all my sins. He didn't deserve those, but he got all my sins. And what did Christ get in re uh, give us in return? He gave me all his righteousness. So he got my sins. I got his righteousness. God is satisfied, and now I'm right with God. I can walk in, and I don't have to worry about God being angry with me. The, the fellowship between God and myself is restored. And that's through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Isn't that simple? But isn't that the truth? That's the way truth works. And, and so they have the same father. The third thing is they've had a similar fate. Would you notice this? I'm your brother and companion in tribulation. That word companion means to have fellowship with, to have something in common with. And what he's saying there is, I'm in the same boat as you are. Look, I may not be in Ephesus. I may not be in Smyrna. I may not be in Thyatira. I may not be in Laodicea. I may not be in any of these other churches, but I know what you're going through. Now, think about that for just a minute. It, it, look, it means something if somebody tells me... Um, 
I'm sorry for your loss. And you know, somebody just says, I, I'm sorry for your loss. That means something. But it means a lot more if somebody can say, you know, I lost my mother back in 2009, which I can say. I lost my mother in 2009, and I know the pain of losing a parent, and I want you to know I'll be praying for you. You know, that means more to people than just simply, well, I, I, I feel sorry for you. I, I'll pray for you and all of that. Never forget, uh, my sister had a little companion, used to play with her all the time. I think she was 11 years old, and she started complaining of back problems. Things were bothering in, in her back, and they took her to the hospital and found out she had an inoperable cancer. And little Jerry died, um, and they buried her wearing my sister's dress. My sister had given her a dress, and um, I'll never forget, they buried little Jerry in that dress. And I remember going up to that man, um, Larry, uh, and, and I looked at Larry, and I said, you know, sir, um, I am so sorry for you. I, I'm sorry for your loss. But, you know, I was a 14-year-old boy, and I, I don't know how much I could really matter to him by saying something like that. But, you know, now, um, having lived as long as I have and most of my family is up in heaven right now and I've held their hands as they've wa walked out into eternity. Now when somebody tells me um, I've lost a loved one, my heart beats with their heart because I know what they're going through. I I I've buried a mama. I've buried a daddy. Um, I know what it's like. When, when somebody tells me I'm in pain, brother, I understand. Um, I, I, I know what pain is. Um, somebody tells me I, I'm paralyzed. I know what it's like to be paralyzed. I, uh, I was in a wheelchair. Um, I know what that's like. And so I'm here to tell you today, there are a lot of things you learn once you've been a companion of somebody. But in that, let's take it to the nth degree. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but has experienced every one of them that we've experienced. We can know when we go to him, if I'm tired, I know he know what tired was. When I'm betrayed by somebody, I know he understands what it is to be betrayed. When I'm misunderstood, I know he understands what it is to be misunderstood. When people turn their backs on me, I know he understands what it's like to have people turn their back on you. Uh, and so I can go and find comfort in him in a time of need. So a companion, a similar fate. And then finally, or next to last, the Savior's followers. He says, not only am I a companion in tribulation, but I'm also one of the followers of the Savior in the kingdom and patience of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look here. The kingdom of Christ has two aspects. The first one is the patience. The second is the performance. Now, right now, we're in the patience. Now, I'll just make this comment to you today. It does not look like Jesus is ruling this world right now. It really doesn't. You listen to what's going up in Washington. You listen to what's going on in Atlanta. You listen to what's going on in Macon. And you think, how could Jesus be running all of this stuff? This is a mess. Things are falling apart. My friend, you don't see it. You don't know it. But remember, at one of the most critical times in the nation Israel history, good King Uzziah had died. And um, the man who was getting ready to come into the throne was not nearly the man that Uzziah would be. And uh, Isaiah was worried about that. And he went to the temple and he fell on his face before God. And then the Bible says, And I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and his, his train filled the temple. And suddenly Isaiah realized, wait a minute, it doesn't look like it, but God's really running this world. He's in charge. This is what we call the patience part of the kingdom of God. Right now, Jesus is working. 
And he's working behind the scenes and he's working in individual hearts. I read an interesting book this week. Brett Baer um, from Fox News has put out a, a great new book on, um, on the last three days of uh, the administration of uh, uh, President Eisenhower, a very underrated man as far as U.S. history goes. But uh, in the last three days of Eisenhower's presidency, and Eisenhower believed in working behind the scenes. He talked about being the hidden hand. He didn't outwardly try and change things. He did it quietly and behind the scenes. And he was very effective for, for eight years, for example. Let me say, when he came into office, there was a war in Korea. When he ended that war in Korea, and for the eight years that Eisenhower was president, nobody dared get the United States involved in a war. There was nobody who dared get the United States involved in a war. You know why? Because they knew that they would get whipped if they did. And Eisenhower uh, kept the peace for eight long years. There, it's the longest period of peace in the, um, in, in the uh, entire century. In that entire 20th century, the longest period of peace. Eight years with no war that the United States is involved in. Now, let me say this to you today. That's a patient application of a carefully plotted strategy. And that's what's going on in this world right now. <clears throat> you may not think it. You may not see it. But God is behind the scenes. And he is pulling the levers. And he says, and, and he says to his people at that time, I know it's bad. I know you're being persecuted. I know that it looks like right now that wrong is going to triumph. But he said, you just be patient. Jesus shall reign. Things will get done. And you look at how history unfolded, it was exactly that. Um, and the gospel has gone forth and the world has heard the message of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I, I think he's coming. I think he's coming soon. But right now it's the patient part. There will be the performance part when he leaves this world. And for the next seven years, there's going to be tribulation on this earth. But you know what he's doing? He's removing the squatters. He's taking those people out that, that don't belong here. And by the time Jesus is finished, at the end of that seven-year tribulation period, when he comes back, he's going to rule and reign. And there's going to be a saved people on this earth. And you and I are going to rule and reign with them. And so the performance part of the kingdom is coming. And it's coming soon. So we're right now the followers of the Lord. And it's hard in, in this part of the, of the battle. It's not, I mean, it's one thing when you're out in the middle of battle and all of that, but a cold war is a lot harder to deal with than a hot, a hot war. When people aren't getting picked off right and left, but where things are just being rotten and undermined from underneath, that's when it's really difficult. But that's when we need to be at our best, church. That's where we need to be on our knees. So we see a simple familiarity, a same father, a similar fate, the Savior's followers, and finally a suffering fellowship. And you notice what he says here, the patience of Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you something, my friends. Jesus is very patient. Um, the Bible talks about God when it talks about um, Abraham and um, Joseph and the, uh, what's going to happen in the future. And he told those folks, he said, look, the, the fullness of the Amorites has not yet come in. Um, I'm going to be patient with these people for a little bit longer. These were ungodly, wicked people. So the children of Israel go 400 and 30 some years down in, in Egypt. And, and man, they suffered and all of that. But during that time, God was giving the Amorites a second chance. And he was, he was ministering to them and he was trying to reach them. But these people became a terminal case. And so now he says, 
the, Am the fullness of the Amorites has come in, go up and, and fight against them and, and discomfort them and, and, and wipe them out. And by the way, have you ever met an Amorite? They're not to be seen anymore. They're wiped out because God was patient for 430 years, but the patience of God comes to an end. Now, I want to say this to you today. The United States of America has adopted eugenics. Have you ever heard of the, the organization called Planned Parenthood? Planned Parenthood is the number one promoter of eugenics in the world. That was Hitler's program of sterilizing the unnecessary people, to wipe out the unnecessary people. They did it by concentration camps and gas chambers. Um, and that's how they did it. In America, we're too good for that. We now have Supreme Court rulings, and we have nice clinics that ladies can go in and murder their babies. And we have nice places where old people can go and be put to death quietly and out of the way so that nobody notices what happens to them. But I'm telling you, friends, human life is not worth a fig anymore. And so this country is going to pay an awful price. We are as bad as Hitler's Germany. It's just that we're doing it slowly and behind sterile doors. And we ought to be on our knees before Almighty God confessing and repenting because we have sinned against God. And right now, he's being patient. But my friends, there will come a time when the patience is over. And you know what the first thing that happens when the patience between two governments is over? They call the ambassadors home. And my friends, you know what the next thing on God's program is? He's going to call us home to be with him. Let's look at... Um, some things about um, th this man here. And let's notice here not only his partnership, but let's notice uh, 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 four things, three things here and one more thing after that. I want you to notice uh, not only his partnership, but let's notice his prison. Let's notice his prison. Um, he says he was on the Isle of Patmos, which is called Patmos. Now, if you look at that map up there, and I put it in a uh, big red dot right out in the middle of that, as you can see, he is right in the middle of nowhere. Now, I have something to say to you that you may not enjoy, but it's true nonetheless. Sometimes God wants to put us in a hard place where he can use us. We get the idea that when the car is running well and when the plumbing is functioning correctly and when um, the flowers are blooming just right and when our house is nice and dry and uh, when our kids are all well and uh, when we have no sickness and no illness and all of that, that we're in the center of God's will. Oh, contrary. Um, how do you make tea? Don't you take a tea bag and put it in the middle of hot water? My friends, if you're going to live for Christ, you're going to find yourself in hot water and maybe in a hard place. And you say, I don't know why God is doing this. I'll tell you, I don't know why God wouldn't be doing that. That brings out the flavor in our Christian life. It's taken me a long time to come to that position. I have to realize sometimes it is not when God's face is smiling on me and, and all things are right and all of that that I'm in the center of God's will. That's when I fall away from Him the most. When I'm in the center of God's will is when I'm hurting or I need something and um, I'm in a difficult situation. I don't know where to turn and all of that. And I look up to God and say, help me, God. He said, that's exactly where I put you. I wanted you to be in that place. You know, many of us pray in our prayers to get out of exactly the place that God put us. We need to realize that when we are in the middle of our trouble, that's when God can use us. So let's not be so quick to say, um, 
you know, I wish I knew that I had a steady income coming in or I wish I knew that this job was taken care of. That's when God is showing himself to be mighty and strong and able. Not when things are going smoothly and all that. So his prison, a bad place. But notice, his prison didn't keep him from preaching for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. How do you think John got there? How do you think John ended up in Patmos? I'll tell you why. It was for the word of God and the testimony of Christ. John wouldn't shut up. The world says, just get along. Go along. Uh, be along with all the rest of us. But if we dare go the other way, I'm telling you, if you get Hollywood against you, oh, man, those mean people. Um, all these stars talking about, I won't be in Trump's inauguration. And they pressure the other one. There was a, a blind opera singer that was going to be singing in the, in the thing, and, and he said, I can't, I can't do it. I can't bear the pressure. I, I can't stand it. And that little, uh, little girl, Jackie Ivanko, came up and said, I'll do it. I don't care. I don't care what the world says. I was homeschooled. By the way, she's homeschooled. And uh, uh, my parents taught me to stand up for what's right, whether anybody else believes it or not. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you something, friends. We need to, to just take our stand for the right things, don't we? We just uh, don't be silenced by the world. We need to stand up and say, look, that there is no such thing as transgender. It is people who are sinful. Just, just put it like that. They, they, they're just sinners. And they need to understand, look, you're either born a man or a woman. You're not born something in between. And if you're born a man, then you take what God gave you and, and be a man. And if you're born a woman, then be a woman and be the best woman you can be. There's nobody who's born an it. Now you become an it later on. Um, there are lots of it's out there today, but it's because their thinking has been warped by the world. And you know, I'm really having a problem today with the, the, the world and what they present to our children in school. Because, and look, if your kids are exposed to this, you need to do some work on this because they're, they're now teaching that, you know, um, it's all right to explore your feminine side if you're a boy. In fact, you may not really be a boy. You may be a girl. And just trapped inside of a boy's body. And you may be a, a, a boy trapped inside of a girl's body. Well, I'm going to tell you something. God made us who we are. And not to accept that is, is rebellion against God. No such thing as transgender. And I, um, I go to the Walmart and I look at these things that go out through there and I think, you need to be spanked. Um, you need somebody to, to, to look at you like the, the, the old story of the emperor's new clothes and say, Mommy, look at that man. He's strange. Oh, we, we can't. We've got to be tolerant. No, we don't. The Bible is not tolerant. You're either sinful or not. So his preaching got him in trouble. And I want you to notice his pattern. He said, I was in the Spirit. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit. Now, um, I don't know any other way to put this, that there are some people that to be spiritual is to be a strange experience. But my friends, all of us in this room, there is not a person in this room that shouldn't be spiritual. What do I mean by that? I mean to be controlled and be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. This man said, I was being controlled, I was being filled, I was being directed by the Holy Spirit. Now, it was on the Lord's Day, and that's one place that you can show whether somebody is, are they in church on Sunday? Um, 
a man who is spiritual is not a man who is fleshly, is not thinking about the things of the flesh all the time, is a person who's concerned about spiritual things. And this final thing I want to close with then, um, and by the way, here's, here's a picture of Patmos. You want to think a bad place. That's where, that's where John was. And it was not a nice place. Another picture of it here. This is the, the only little town on Patmos. Just one little cluster of uh, uh, a little harbor, little cluster of places, a wild, unforgiving place. Um, but now I want you to look finally at his prophecy. At his prophecy. And I close with this today. Uh, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, um, there are two interpretations of the, of the idea of the Lord's day. Um, the first would be that it was Sunday. And I see that that's a natural interpretation. Um, and I think that probably was when this happened. Uh, it, certainly to be a spiritual person is to be in the Lord's house on Sunday where we belong. But the second thing is that there is a designation of a period of time beginning at the rapture of the church and running all the way to the uh, end of the millennium, and that is called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord begins with the rapture of the church, ends with Christ turning the kingdom over to God for eternity. That is what we call the day of the Lord. And that's what happened, and I believe that's what he's talking about here. He said, I was in the Spirit, and God lifted him out of this world and let him see the events that were to come in the future. And so the Bible says that I heard behind me a great voice. This is a voice of power. This is a voice that is roaring. This is a voice that's going to set all things right. And so what, do we, what does this voice sound like? It sounds like a trumpet. A trumpet is pictured here. Now the shofar, the trumpet, that the children of Israel was used for three purposes. I close with this. Number one, they always used the shofar to warn the people. When the enemy was coming and God wanted to gather his people to a place of safety, he would have the priest blow the shofar. And when they heard that sound, it meant it's time to gather together. Now, my friends, the very next event on God's calendar, we're going to see it in Revelation chapter 4, the very first verse, we're going to see he's going to say, come up hither, and it's going to be the voice of a trumpet. The next voice we hear, and, and Paul tells us about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when he says the Lord will come with the voice of the archangel and the sound of a trumpet and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds of the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The first thing is the warning. He's going to gather his people together. The second is a call to worship call to worship. The, 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 the thing that they would do in those days was they would blow that and brother, let me tell you when, when God calls his own home, there's going to be a hallelujah meeting. I'm going to tell you something. I can't wait to see my grandma. I can't wait to see my grandpa. I can't wait to see my mama again. I can't wait to see my daddy again. I can't wait to see all of my family who've gone on before, but friends, that's nothing compared to seeing him for the first time. I want to fall at his feet. And I just want to, I want to lay there and worship him. And, and I know you'll be there too. And I know that'll be your attitude too. You'll want to worship him. And brother, that's going to be the glory of heaven that we'll be able to worship with our loved ones for all of eternity. And then finally, it's a call for warfare. Because God Almighty is going to set loose a war on this world like has never been seen before. Let me tell you something. Don't put your money in gold. Don't put your money in silver. Don't buy stocks. Don't buy bonds. Put your money in heaven where it belongs. Invest in the gospel. Get the gospel out. Share the gospel with a, with a lost and dying world. Because ladies and gentlemen, all this is going to the dust. 
I don't care how good your investments are. Within a hundred years, those things will be gone. But I'll tell you what lasts is when people trust the Lord Jesus Christ. The war is joined. It's time to get into battle. Gird on your sword. The trumpet sounded. It's time for us to move. Let's pray. Our heavenly